Welcome everybody. It's uh, Wednesday the 26th of May. It is uh, starting to be summer. So this has changed the shed for those of you who are new here. I've been doing this since the beginning of the pandemic. So we're still here and it's um, something I still do about twice a month. And it's been a lot of fun to see all of you uh, come and hang out with me about every other Wednesday now. And um, you're coming in from all over Washington, Oregon, Texas, Texas, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Vermont, Rhode Island, Georgia. Ooh, we have a whole crew of people from the United States in the house. So um, thank you all for showing up this morning. The weather's getting warmer. We'll see if people still want to jump online on Wednesday morning uh, when summer hits, but um, it helps me get some weaving done, so. <laughs> Michelle says her washing machine was declared dead this morning. I'm really sorry, Michelle. There are moments when I hear the washer going and I'm thinking, that washer's really old. When's it gonna give up the ghost? Eva Luna from Spain. Europe is in the house. That's excellent. Um, Healdsburg, Maryland. Canada, yay! Uh, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Iowa. UK, hi Anna, um, Massachusetts, I'm happy you're all here. It is getting warmer in Colorado little by little. In this little area of Colorado, I live way at the north um, central part of Colorado and we've had um, way more rain than usual, which is a fantastic thing because it's been coming in little small bits. Because uh, usually what happens is we either have drought or flooding. So happy to have a little bit of rain and looking at how green everything is. So fingers crossed for no fires this year. If you've been following me, you saw all the fire stuff from last summer. So hoping that doesn't happen. It will happen all over the U.S., but I'm just hoping it doesn't happen in my backyard this year. Let's look at... Um, hand basket. So I've had so many people ask me about this tapestry that I thought I better bring it back. I was hoping to have it almost finished the next time I brought it back, but it's been a bit of a crazy month. So as you can see, I have not woven that much more since the last time you saw it, but we're going to get it finished. It will be finished in June. Uh, June, you heard me say that, right? It'll be finished in June. So let's flip this around. And I'll show you what I am working on. Um, yeah, I added another color here and I've almost finished the words. I just need a T. And I have changed the design a little bit in the top corner. So that'll be interesting. Maybe next time we do this, I'll be working on that. Oh no, Ruth said she missed the eclipse. Ruth, I didn't know there was an eclipse. Oh, wow. I have been intentionally not watching the news for a couple weeks. It's been more than I could handle. And so that actually includes things like there was an eclipse. So sorry you couldn't see it either. Oh, Marina, you're in the Denver airport. DIA. Boy, have they finished updating that place yet? My gosh. I have not flown in over a year, but the last two years before that, they're doing major renovations to DIA and what a pain in the rear. I mean, renovations are great, but whoo. Okay, so I'm just gonna fill in, I'm show, gonna show you how I'm doing this little basket. This is, um, ah, Fiber by Nature asked, am I using a Murex? No, actually, let me zoom out and so you can see what I'm doing. This is um, the Shacked Aras loom and I have two shedding devices on it here so I'm not sure that I recommend two shedding devices it was a um, it was a, an experiment which works somewhat but uh, actually I'll show you here how that goes um, let's see if I can zoom in that much maybe you can see what I'm doing so one of the shedding devices does the 8 EPI which is this you can see here there's um, 
looks like a regular set. And then look here, this is 16 EPI, so the warps are doubled. So one shedding device is for 16 and one is for eight. And the one for eight is on the top. And so I think you can see it in the bottom photo of me. Um, that is um, heddled so that it works for the eight EPI. But only one of the sheds is really working. The other one, this other shedding device, um, is in the way of it creating a good shed. So, uh, this is, for this little part of this basket, this is Weaver's Bazaar. It's actually 18.2. It's the thinnest one that they have there fine because I just don't have a lot of colors in the medium. At 80 PI, I probably would have used, gone for three mediums instead of, this is six. Um, here, let's see if you can see this. This is six fine, uh, which means I get a good color mix, but it would be um, less fuss if I had the medium, but I just don't have that many colors in the medium. So I'm using the fine. Um, and I like it, I chose it for the basket because it is much shinier than this other wool, which is Harrisville Kohler Singles. And so I like how it looks more like, you know, you would see a, um, a basket that has real shiny wicker sort of thing. I really need to roll this down but I didn't do it so that you could see more of what I was working on. I would normally have the weaving a little bit lower on the loom so that I'm, you can see in the bottom how I'm having to reach up a little too high. That's an ergonomic issue, which will show up in my neck and shoulders. So as you're weaving whatever loom you have, keep the loom in an ergonomic position and it might mean you have to move the loom sometimes if it's a portable table loom. If not, take breaks, take breaks anyway. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> Let's see. Oh, you just got a Louette Erica. I don't know that loom, but um, Louette does make some looms that work quite well for tapestry. I'm really surprised by their um, table looms. Most table looms don't work well <clears throat> for tapestry, but <clears throat> I've been in a workshop with some people who had Louettes, the table loom, the older ones or the newer ones, and they have really great tension. So that is fabulous. Okay. All right. <clears throat> A typical two tapestry weaving. You have to build up certain areas before you can do others. <clears throat> so, though I was not going to work on this basket today, I'll just show you how I'm filling it in. Oh yeah, um, Audrey, great question and a great excuse for me to keep working on this basket because I can show you. Audrey wants to, let's see if I can get that camera from changing the focus all the time. Okay. Um, Audrey wants to know about eccentric <clears throat> weaving accent. Hold on just a second. Audrey wants to know about weaving um, eccentrically. So um, I'll just talk about it in this because I'm going to do an outline here, which would be eccentric um, outline. Basically, of course, when you're weaving tapestry, you want to keep the weft perpendicular to the warp. So the warp's going this way. I want to weave it. I want to weave the weft perpendicular whenever possible. So though I would have actually really loved to make this basket with the weft traveling like this because I think it would look more like a basket 
and there are actually other techniques that I could have um, used maybe to give that effect um, a little bit more, maybe a little bit of pick and pick at the top of this form or something. I didn't actually have the patience um, to put that in, but that would have been an interesting choice. So um, I don't want to weave this much, and it would end up being this whole basket eccentrically because it will affect the fabric. It will the it will pull the warps out of alignment. So and the fabric there won't be flat if I did that much of it. If you do a few sequences, it works great. It's really fun. And it depends on the materials and the loom. It depends on a lot of things. But in general, weaving eccentrically over a lot of space will cause your fabric to buckle. If you're doing wedge weave, that's an eccentric weave, but it's even. It's evenly balanced, so you get scallops on the side, but the fabric is flat because it's evenly the eccentricness is balanced. <laughs> that seems like a metaphor for something, right? Um, oh, and and Audrey's asking about adding a new shape. How do you know which way to put in the um, next color? That is about meet and separate, and and it's just about um, shedding. So let's see. I really wish I had moved this weaving down a little bit because it gets tight. I just don't have enough room for my hand up to where the shedding device is. The warp isn't that tight because the loom is really tall. I was trying to fill in a little bit there, but because that second shedding, usually the shed on this loom is really great, and it is with the other shedding device, but this one that's on top is really not giving me much of a shed. I can't actually get my fingers in there, which is why it looks like I'm picking every weft. Let's see. That's better. Getting things in the right shed is a challenge for newer tapestry weavers. And there's lots of different ways people teach it. Um, instructors like Archie Brennan and Susan Martin Maffei always teach on, um, well, Archie isn't with us anymore, but they teach on pipe looms. And the advantage of a pipe loom is that it gives you a reference. So a loom like this that has shedding, it's hard to know, you know, the two sheds are kind of identical. On a pipe loom, you have that bar at the top that's holding one shed open, that's the open shed, and the other shed is the closed shed. So you always have a reference and you can make rules around that, like, okay, this one started going this direction in the closed shed, so this one needs to go the other direction in the closed shed. On um, any loom that has this kind of rotating heddle bar, it's harder to keep track of that. So you have to get good at looking. Not that you should just rely on rules anyway. You should be able to look at your weaving and know what shed something is in. Let's see, let's put one more there. I just wanna fill this area in. So I can do that eccentric line. Oh, I'm playing yarn chicken here, you guys. I was hoping I would have enough yarn. Ah. Yarn chicken is not my favorite game. <clears throat> Paula asked if I mixed um, medium and fine Weaver's Bazaar. Yes, it works great. 
Um, you can definitely mix the medium and fine Weaver's Bazaar yarns. It's a really uh, great way to get different color mixes and different size bundles and such. That is a great thing to do. Oh, I hate it when I only need a few inches of yarn and I don't have it. Ah! It's the worst. At least I have more. Bummer. Okay. I keep my, uh, I used to buy yogurt this way in tubs. Anyway, little bowls are great for, um, to keep the yarn from jumping around, rolling under your studio. Okay. So I think I'm going to change the mix on the next thing. So I only need a small piece of yarn. Oh, awesome, Christine. She says the Erica, we were talking about the Louette, um, that the Erica is a small table loom that works. Could be used for tapestry for small pieces. It has excellent tension. Great. Thanks, Christine. Good to know. Yeah, I've been, I don't own a Louette, but every time I see one in a workshop, I'm pretty impressed with those looms. So I'm not surprised that it has great tension. Oh, look what I did right away. Um, I only used three strands and I need six and that bundle felt real thin. I can't remember the last time I worked on this tapestry here, but, um, Pretty sure I haven't done much on it since then. So thanks, Barbara, for your comment on the shading. I did a little, tried to do a little shading on the inside, which seems to have worked. One of the things, this loom has been sitting in my studio, obviously, for a long time now. Um, one thing I wish I had done differently is this dark green. Um, actually, both of these greens. I wish that they had been, um, let's see if you can see this green around the figure. I think the value is a little bit too dark compared with the, f the f um, colors of the, f I wanted the figure to stand out and the greens are a little bit dark for that in terms of value. So if I were going to do it again, I would have chosen a different yarn there. Okay, we're almost there. One thing I love about the Aras loom is there's a lot of room between the two layers of warp. It's a continuously warped loom, but there's a lot of room between the layers and it means I can get my hand in there. Oops. Yeah, that second shed is not there. Um, oh, funny, Marla's asking about the Mirex. Um, this is not a Merrix Yell, just so you know when I talk about this, but she's asking, um, do you have trouble with a bolt coming unscrewed all the time on the shedding lever on the Merrix? Yes. So I finally asked Merrix about that. I'm like, what do I do? That little nut, is that what you mean, Marla? The little nut flies off and then you can't find it. It's really, um, I wonder if I have one right here. Yeah. Do you mean this? Um, this is a Merrix shedding handle. Do you mean this thing, Marla? This little nut, which is very sweet, but it flies off and then you can't find it. Um, here's the fix. It, I even have it right here because I had to do it recently. Here's the fix. Just use a little bit of this, put it on your fingers, put it on the threads of the handle and screw the nut on. This is super weak glue. So you have to take the handle off when you rewarp the loom, but it doesn't matter. It'll come undone fairly easily, but that glue is just enough to keep that little nut on. At least it's worked for me pretty well. Okay. Okay, yes, great. That's what I would try. I've been using it recently on my Merrick's looms and I have not had um, that little nut fly off since I've been using the glue. So it was actually Claudia's idea at Merrick's because apparently that is something they have been having trouble with forever. Okay, now I'm looking at the sheds. So um, this gets a little bit at that shedding question that Audrey had. 
it starts to get added anyway. I'm gonna put, so as we're looking at what shed something's in, if I put, um, can you see that better? You know what, y'all? It would help if I had a dark paper there, wouldn't it? Hold on. My middle name is not Grace. Although I have a sister-in-law named Grace. Ah, I'm able to get this in here. Okay, maybe this will help. Is that better? Yeah. So, um, one of the sheds here, this is the open shed. If I had um, no shedding device, this is the shed I was just weaving in. So I know I want the other shed. And what I want to do is go through and look and make sure I know because I wove this with one bobbin that it's all going to be in the same shed. But I would go through and check and make sure, say there were different colors or something happening. Go through and make sure that this is the, ne the next shed I need to weave in is this one. And I can tell that with a shedding little shed stick. Um, so I know it's that shed. The one thing I want to check is here. So up at the top, if I go like this, oh, those are in two different sheds. So this one is ready to weave, but this one isn't, which of course I knew because, um, just because I remember the tail was here and I need the tail to end up at the other side. Those are little tricks that you get to realize over time. So now all of that is in the same shed and I can put in my, I'm gonna do an outline just like this. Um, I'm trying to remember how many strands I use. Um, I know this was a thinner bundle. So I think it was three. Notes are really helpful, especially if you're going to procrastinate on finishing a piece for so long. I did end up making notes about what colors I was using because I was losing track of some of the mixes. So that is helpful. Um, so I have, um, it's unfortunately going to be not the easiest to get in because of this shedding issue, but we're going to put that in like this. Is this even open at all? you need extra under, under, under. oh the reason I made that comment earlier about I was um, um, I was trying to get to a part that I wanted to show you today um, yesterday and uh, realized I had to weave, you have to weave um, the shapes underneath first. So I think the shedding device would work better. Uh, okay. And then there's things like, oh, I didn't sew this slit yet. So I super duper prefer to sew slits. before I weave on top of them. I don't like sewing slits off the loom. I like the stitching to be invisible and the only easy way to do that is if you do it on the loom. There are many ways to sew slits. You can do it your way, but my way involves on the loom. And this slit is um, a long enough one I don't wanna leave it unsewn. Crap, sorry about that. I just read, um, I just read a young adult fiction 
novel. It's called Fighting Words. Highly recommended if you like young adult fiction or you know teenagers who um, middle. This is like middle grade fiction. Um, occasionally, I buy them and think, "Oh, I'll send them to my niece." But really, I just like some of these authors are amazing. So anyway, it's called Fighting Words, and uh, throughout the whole story, it's a story, actually, a story about a couple young girls who um, had a lot of trauma, and it, it has a very positive spin at the end. But um, the <laughs> the point is, is that the one of the young girls um, in the book. Actually, in the book, they um, they didn't want to swear in the book. So she uses the word snow all the time instead of um, a swear word. Um, sorry, that was super random. But maybe maybe when on, um, when on YouTube Live, I need a particular swear word that is uh, something like snow. Okay. Great. Now I can do this. Feels like all thumbs today, y'all. I don't know what's in the air. So I'm not going to finish this basket part today because Think you can see how it's going to work, but let's put the outline in. More bubbling for outlines, and those of you in my classes know that I like splicing. This particular yarn, Weaver's Bazaar, is um, super slippery and the splices don't really hold. So with fuzzy yarn, I cut my splices off right at the surface of the tapestry on the back. But with this yarn, I don't do that because it tends to pull out. It's just too slick. Um, but I do sometimes still do the splice because it spreads the yarn out a little bit and then I will either leave a, just leave the tails. So they're not all bunched together, they're sort of spread out. Or I might um, stitch them in a little bit. Yes, yeah, so good, um, good question, Jean. Um, the what if they weren't all in the same shed? So yes, if you wove this with a couple colors, say I had hatched it together or something, or I had pick and pick going or something, um, I would want to check and make sure that everything was in the same. If I don't have it all in the same shed when I put this um, eccentric line in, you'll see the lice where it's where I have two wefts in the same shed. It'll look a little bit like you can see it right there, the little. Um, warps popping through. That will pack in in this case because it is in the right shed, but if it isn't in the right shed, you'll, you may well see that. So if you have two things in there working in meat and separate, it should still be in the right shed. However, sometimes that doesn't happen, and so then you use a piece of crepaud. Um, or you flip the way the butterflies are. You, you somehow shift the shed with another piece of yarn. So if you're in the um, Warp and Weft class, I talk about that a fair amount um, with more coming. So there is um, a lot of confusion about shifting sheds, and I've done some videos about that, but would, I'm going to be doing a more in-depth video for some classes about uh, how to ship the shed because I just think it's um, not intuitive for many people. Um, yes, Jessica, Kimberly Brubaker Bradley wrote Fighting Words. That's the author. Thank you. I was not going to come up with that. Um, Kathleen asked, when you were going up the curve, did you always turn on the same kind of warp, either raised or low? No. Um, 
I have difficulty ending up in the same shed when I go to outline. No, um, I did not because I want to make, if I had always turned on a, a hill or a valley thread as I was weaving this, uh, I would have a straight diagonal instead of a curve. So to make a curve, you have to make your steps uneven or build them up or some, it's not a regular form. So no, I definitely didn't do that. Um, if you're only using one butterfly like this, it should all be in the same shed regardless. If you have a couple different things going on, it may end up in different sheds, in which case you have to fix it. Uh, okay. So let's look at, so this is the top of, you probably can't, I don't know if you can really see. Now I've lost my magnet here, but. This, yeah, you can sort of see that. This is the top of the basket. So this is the end of the square of this um, central form. I actually was looking for a picture of this cartoon this morning and, oh, you know what? Now that that magnet came off, I'll just take it out. Uh, so here's the whole, oh, you're not gonna be able to see that. Um, cred, here, I'm gonna do this. So I was told there would be a hand basket. This is the whole cartoon. And I changed this top corner over here to add um, a butterfly and blue sky because um, 2020 is gone. Originally, it actually said 2020 at the bottom, and I took that out. But um, it's a riff on that um, going to hell in a hand basket thing, which is what 2020 felt like. So we're almost done. <laughs> Yay. So that's what that looks like. And I have one more T to put in here, which I thought I would um, see if I can finish some of that up here today. Another thing I've been doing, which has worked before and I hope it continues to work, is actually hooking this, when this, there's a slit like this, oh, sorry, <laughs> you can't see that at all. Um, here, there's this would have been a long slit, and I'm hooking this 16 EPI in between the bits of this, like a little join, because um, I could stitch it, but harder to stitch the 16, and this is so thin, I thought, oh, it's a little cheap. It'll um, not show, so I'm not completely sure it won't show, but this is what I mean. Usually I sew the slits with a different kind of thread, but I mean, I did it all along here and you can't see it. So there, I can see it a little bit. There's a tension thing. So just going between these two layers and through one of these. Actually, I wonder if it would pull in better if I, there's two warp threads there. If I actually wove it in, huh. experiments. Or if that's going to make it show more. All right, and right there. Oh crap, I took my cartoon out. Oh no, okay. I have to put the T in and uh, it goes right there. And back to this little hand. Um, hand tip, I think is what he calls it, from Andrew Dickinson. I know a bunch of you bought these because the last time I had it on Change the Shed, he's totally sold out. So um, I think it, it's like my new favorite tool for this kind of thing, for weaving at 16 EPI. Holy crap, it's great. Oh, I did it again. See, that's why I wanted to use the word snow. No swearing. Okay, so I'm building this up so that I can put in the T goes like this. There's a little crossbar here and then it, it's a little bit of a diagonal. So I'm building this up at a little diagonal line here so I can fill in the last letter. 
It's been fun weaving these letters, mostly because I um, decided not to try to make them super regular. So that took a lot of pressure off. Good. Mm. I think I would have liked that to come over a little bit there, but <laughs> Barbara says sophisticated weavers could use kapo instead of snow. That sounds good, actually. Um, I think it. I think Repo only has one P, but oh, it's one of those words I wish we had a, I wish the tapestry community had an English word for that, but um, it's all good. There's no reason we can't use French words. Okay. I can't decide how I want to do that. I'm gonna try to put this back in, y'all. You've already seen me bend over and everything else. Let's just put this, see how much more awkwardness we can add to this. Change the shed. So there you can see, right? Can you see that? Yeah, that's where that goes. Okay. Um. Honestly, just trying to decide something that probably doesn't matter that much. Yeah, Michelle, that's actually a really good comment there. Um, the try it and see approach is not a bad one. I do it all the time. I'm fairly certain most weavers do it all the time. I think you don't really know. Um, I think you don't really know um, sometimes how something's going to work until you try it. There's no reason you can't try something. And then, um, you know, change your mind. So this is the color of the letters. It's a deep green, which it's like a deep teal green. I quite like it a lot. Um, I need to get, I need to get this. Started on one warp and this is a time when I often will take stuff out in this case I probably won't but um, if I'm starting something on one wrap I often have to try it a couple times to get it to go the right way to make meet and separate work sometimes it even means unweaving heaven forbid so um, I want to get this little cross piece in here because this is another situation where um, I want to weave this. Can you see that? Yeah. This light purple on top of this. So I have to weave the green first, of course. Okay. Not super happy with this little join there. I'm looking forward to this getting up to this point because I'm hoping that will pull back together. I don't like how that tension is pulling that apart and you can fix a lot of things off the loom if necessary. That will be stitched um, if it doesn't come back together nicely. You can stitch it off the loom. 
But once off tension, I think it will be all right. All right, everyone. So I'm going to try to, oh, yeah, and then I'm, when I start talking, I lose track. I need this T to be on a diagonal. Looks like I'm not quite there yet. So I'm going to need to build up this purple to a little triangle like that there so that this whole line can go on a diagonal. So that is the next thing I will be working on. So thank you all for coming to change the shed again. I um, actually have really enjoyed working on this piece again this week. So I appreciate all of you who asked about hand basket and um, I think I'm ready to finish it. So, so that is a good thing. Um, yeah, I think that it's time to get this little guy off the loom. I also would like to use this loom for something else. So, and I only have one of these shacked Aras looms. So it's uh, going to be nice to move on. I hope you're all well and that you've had a great week so far, that you've gotten your vaccine. And um, those of you in the US, I know those of you overseas, a lot of you don't um, necessarily have access yet to a vaccine. I'm really sorry that the US has been such a hog. And um, I hope that you get are able to get one soon. Take care of yourselves. Please be careful and keep weaving. And um, yes, Barbara just said, I really hope um, I keep this up or we keep this up post pandemic. I don't really have any um, thoughts of stopping right now. I've been having a lot of fun and you know, every two weeks is a pretty good timing for me. So I, it'd be nice if it was a little more often, but it's what I can do. So thanks everyone. Thanks so much for coming. It's always fun to see your comments and questions and Use that um, hashtag, especially if you're on Instagram. If you're weaving stuff, we can see what you're doing. That would be really fantastic. So um, I'll see you again in two weeks. I can't remember the date at this point, this June something. Um, but it's always on the website if you need to check when I'm coming. And if you don't see it on the website because I've screwed it up, you should email me and let me know. So. Thanks, you all. I'll see you in a couple weeks.